please welcome to the stage the incomparable Pooja Pawaskar. Good morning. Um, thank you, Creative Mornings and Marwan for having me here. Today we are going to talk about reverie. Now, what is reverie? It's a state of being pleasantly lost in one's own thought, a daydream. So human brain is a beautiful dance between survival and inspiration. What is survival? It's essentially focusing on security, clothing, food, and shelter. And once those primal needs are taken care of, our brain toggles to downtime. Now downtime is where the beauty lies because this is what distinguishes us from other animals. Uh, we can plan into our future like 30, 50, 80 years into our future and not just our future, our descendants future, our society's future, our nation's future. So most of what we do during downtime are mundane everyday thoughts like doing laundry, doing grocery, um, investing in mutual funds, buying a house, which is, still <laughs> which is still kind of supporting that survival mode. But once in a blue moon, very rarely when you're ready for it and when you're ready to listen to the signs, you have a communion with reverie. And you can call it what you want. It could be reverie, trance state, flow state, and I'm gonna call it flow state for the most of this conversation. But this is where the magic happens, and this is what we are gonna be focusing on today. Because we as creatives, we crave this, we want this, we are willing to take psychedelic substances to evoke this, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, when we do have a communion with Reverie, we can create amazing, avant-garde architecture like this building by Zaha Hadid, or cool gadgets like these that are not groundbreaking, but they're still pretty cool. I really think this person was smoking pot when <laughs> they came up with that. Uh, so the focus is not to be most innovative. The focus of this talk, talk is to be creative, and that's what we are gonna focus on. So we have three agendas for today's talk. How do, you how do you give a concrete form to an abstract nebulous idea? How do you trigger that flow state? And how do you choose creativity over fear when you have achieved the flow state? So I'm gonna start by talking about this little girl over there. She is dressed for picture day. I mean, she's wearing a nice frock. Everybody is lined up, the teacher is in place, the photographer is clearly in front of them, and any minute now, he's gonna say cheese, and the photo is gonna last a lifetime. But she doesn't care about that, she's focusing on choosing curiosity, and focusing on daydreaming, focusing on her reverie. She still takes pictures like that. Uh, if you haven't figured that out by now, that's me. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Pooja Pavaskar. I'm a sculptor and an artist, and I create works in influenced by Wabi Sabi. But essentially what I create are works that evoke conversation around self-worth, self-acceptance, and self-love. So I grew up in the beautiful city of Mumbai, India. That's me. <laughs> I grew up in a joint family with my parents, my paternal grandparents, and my baby sister. And the reason I'm talking about this is I wanna talk about my grandfather. My grandfather comes from a very small rural town, 400 kilometers outside of Mumbai. And he came from a family of farmers and all his siblings, his ancestors, everybody was a farmer. So it was clear to him that he was gonna end up becoming a farmer, but he didn't, he didn't desire that for himself. So at the age of 16, 17, he ran away from home, did not speak to his parents for many years, got a diploma in carpentry, and eventually ended up in Mumbai. And that's how my family ended up in Mumbai. And 
he had a desire for adventure. He had a desire to forge his own path. And that has had a profound influence on me and my creativity. I went to architecture school, which was rigorous, but so amazing because it helped me not just create beautiful structures, but also work with my grandfather, who was also a professional model maker, which kind of came in handy. But it was amazing because it was also our bonding time. He would stay up all night making these beautiful models with me. And I can't stay up all night even now, but he was doing that in his late 70s. So that was pretty amazing to me. Um, after graduating from architecture school, I briefly worked um, at, at an architecture firm in Mumbai. Eventually decided that I wanted to do, I wanted to get a master's in furniture design. I got a scholarship to go study at Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia in the US, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, it opened my eyes to so much beauty and so many amazing creatives who are still friends with me. Um, I got an opportunity to intern for Jonathan Adler in New York City. Um, after graduating, uh, I worked for an interior design firm in San Francisco. But I wanted to move to New Jersey because there was this guy that I had just started dating, Samuel. And I really thought that this was going to go somewhere. So I was very actively trying to move to New Jersey. And I found this beautiful job. It was as an in-house furniture designer for a contract furniture manufacturing company in New Jersey. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's going to be like a good balance between my personal life and my professional life. So yeah, I moved to New Jersey. Sam and I adopted our first dog. Very quickly after that, another dog. And personal life couldn't have been better. But my professional life wasn't going as I envisioned it to. Um, I was very often the only female in the room. Always the only person of color and only immigrant, which kind of made it hard for me to be authentic because there was this real hard focus on assimilation. And we are weird that way. Creatives don't assimilate. So I, I really struggled with that. And it kind of spiraled into like this deep depression and went on for a while. And the only way I knew I could come out of it is by making things with my own hands. So every weekend, every long weekend, I would drive down to New York City to use this communal woodworking space and just create stuff. I was scared of using a lathe. I'd used um, metal lathe, but wood lathe, you are like almost interacting with the wood, which is scary, but I did it because I wanted to get out of that rut. And in, while doing that, what I was doing was I was using free wood that I could get my hands on, anything that people left behind, anything that my coworkers were not using. And I started seeing this pattern, like all of these woods that were rejected were essentially these beautiful woods that had spalting, interesting grains, knots, um, so-called not perfect woods. And I started seeing this resemblance between the wood and me because this wood is like us. It's moving, it's changing, it's cracking, it's getting spalted, so it's basically getting bug bites, but that is making it interesting. And that is essentially who we are. We are interesting because of things that have happened to us, you know? At the same time, I also started studying Wabi Sabi more deeply. And in today's day and age, people think Wabi Sabi is an aesthetics. It's, oh, my house is wabi-sabi, but wabi-sabi is so much more than that. It's a pearl of wisdom that can help us come to terms with our own flaws and imperfection. So it's a Japanese philosophy that essentially talks about appreciating and embracing the imperfections and impermanence amongst us. And it kind of helped me redirect that hate and rewire myself 
And instead of looking for these external validation, find beauty within me and find worth within me before I could even convince anybody else that there was something that I could bring to the table. Yeah, in 2018, Sam and I got married. We applied for PR. Um, very quickly, we moved to Canada. And two weeks after moving there, we registered Wall & Whittle as a business. And then I started creating interesting, beautiful objects using interesting, beautiful woods. So I want to talk about this collection. Uh, it's called In the Gaps Left Behind. And you can see those pieces over here. And feel free to touch them, play with them. They're supposed to be interactive. So for this collection, I specifically wanted to talk about beauty in impermanence. Beauty in aging and beauty um, that lies in passage of time. I also wanted to talk about, uh, I also wanted to focus on sculpture for this collection and hopefully interactive sculptures. So last year, international travel got easier. Sam and I, we had our vaccines. So we decided it was time to go see his parents in Israel. Um, because I'd never been there before, it kind of relieved me from the pressure of planning it. And that was amazing because it allowed me to just experience the place and just sit back and relax. And sometimes that is, that's essential for us as creatives. So one of the places that we went to, it was called Rosh Hanikra. So Rosh Hanikra sits at the border of Israel and Lebanon. And there are these huge cliff rocks that are constantly being hit by water. And that constant collision, that tug and war, is leading to these interesting dents and divots that creates interesting places for people to sit and birds to reside. And I kind of started seeing this. Um, I started relating it to the story that I wanted to tell. Uh, because again, these cliff rocks are turning into what they are because they are getting hit by water. And that collision is slow, and it's over time. And it can only happen over time. You can't rush it. So I was like, this could lead somewhere. So what we did was we just picked up a bunch of stones, interesting stones from various different places, and brought them back home. And placed it on the mantle, in the kitchen, in my studio, and just kept observing them. I also started creating sketches um, to kind of like create that state of reverie, like get there. But it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And I was kind of frustrated, but I kept at it because I knew sometimes it takes time. So I kept at it. And then one evening when we were just cleaning up after dinner, it just came to me. It just came to me in form of these like very interesting images of these rocks that were sitting on my mantle just going back and forth and back and forth. And they were all different in shape and sizes and colors, but they all were kind of working in unison to create this interesting um, rhythm. Oh, oh, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of brings me to the flow state. So what I just described was my flow state, my reverie. So it, it might be different for you, for, but for me, it almost seems like it's approaching and running towards me like really quickly. And I can almost hear it coming towards me, almost like it wants to come hug me and kiss me and be like, oh, I missed you. And in that moment, all I could do, all I can seem to do is just drop everything because it's, the moment is fleeting at, and it requires my immediate attention. So all I can do is just get pen and paper and just start sketching. Start sketching what reverie is telling me. So these were some of the initial sketches that I did right after I had that. And then it evolved. It kept evolving. And these are only some of the nicer ones. I've done some really, really terrible ones. But I, I kept 
kept sketching. And once I did have like five, six good designs that I, co I was confident about, I started pairing them up with woods. So I like to sketch it out on woods to see how it will turn out. And once I'm happy with how the sketch looks, I start trimming out the excess. Just roughly trimming it out to see what it reveals. And once I've trimmed out all of the excess, all of the remaining matter, I go back and I start sketching on the wood again. At this stage, sometimes I see interesting elements like some knots and grains and yeah, that, that creates a new design because I like to retain those interesting parts. I don't like to eliminate it. So they become a part of the design and the design evolves. Because again, it's a collaboration with the wood because wood has its own characteristics and it will let you know. So once I'm happy with the design, it gets a nice bath. Uh, and then I start sanding it again, just refining. So here, now this one is a very artistic choice. It was not a necessity, but you have the freedom to do that if you are the artist. <laughs> so here I'm applying something called as ebonizing liquid. And it reacts, and it reacts with the tannins that are, that are in the wood to turn it brown, dark brown, black, depending upon how many tannin, tannins it has. Yeah. So this piece was relatively easy. That came easily to me. But sometimes the wood likes to fight you. Because like, I'm not doing what you want me to do. So sometimes you have to take a break and let the wood do what it wants to do and then revisit it when you're ready to have that conversation. And here I'm just drawing on that piece of wood to see how I can tweak it and make it better. And once I'm happy with the design, I trim it some more. Over here, I eventually decided to turn it black uh, because I wanted to experiment with lacquer and see how lacquer reacts with this piece of mahogany. And it's still, it was still a piece in progress when I shot it, but I was happy with how the design turned out. So it's essentially sketching, creating, and then finishing, and then going back and doing that all over again, sketching, creating, finishing, sketching, creating, finishing. And very quickly, that process turns into many pieces. And like how I, how I saw in my reverie, they all are still very much themselves, but they replicate these like dents and divots that you could see on the cliff rocks and on the stones. And the other thing that I managed to do was make them interactive. And it kind of came full circle because when you rock them, it, it is creating the same motion as water hitting the cliff rocks. Just for the drama. <laughs> <laughs> So this whole story about this collection was a lead up to our first agenda. How do you give a concrete form to an abstract idea? So again, this changes from project to project. This changes from who is working on it, what's the target, who's the target audience. But for this project, I had a rough idea, a rough brief of what I wanted to do. That was create pieces that strike conversation about beauty and impermanence and I wanted them to be interactive and sculptural. And then I kind of waited for the flow state to arrive. And once I did have the flow state, I found the courage to keep going and did everything that was required to bring it to life. At this point, you would be like, Pooja, that's amazing, but I don't have the time to sit around in my bathtub for my Eureka moment. To that, I would say you should, because I encourage it, I do it myself. But if you're not ready to do that yet, and, are you, and if you're looking for other avenues, 
I'm going to help you through it because that's our second agenda, how to get to the flow state. And once you do have the flow state, how do you find the courage to keep going? So how do you do, do that? How do you trigger your flow state? I would say start carrying a journal, a sketchbook, and just jotting down anything that strikes your interest. Sketching, doodling. I have a book of Henry Moore over here, which is just sketches of Henry Moore. So if you don't know his work, he creates these big garden sculptures. But he did sketches of all sorts, and they made a book out of it, just of the sketches. And these are those sketches that made it to the book. So imagine how many sketches he, he made. And all, all sorts of sketches, really. And then Frank Gehry did it. Frank Gehry doodles, mostly. And I don't understand what he does, but I don't have to. He has to. And then he creates art out of it. I mean. That's not architecture, that's art. If you're not some, someone who does 2D, 3D tangible designs, if you're a musician, if you're a writer, journal, start journaling. You know, day, Do it daily, do morning journals, do journaling all day, every day. And if you don't know what to write, get into the habit of writing the same thing over and over again, like mantras, really. The idea here is to get into the habit of sketching and writing and encouraging our brain to crave the sketching process. In the world, in this digital age, let's not forget to use our digits. Oh, this is my favorite topic. So this is called a morgue file. Start creating a morgue file. So what is a morgue file, really? This term comes from journalists. They get a lot of ideas, a lot of people pitch to them, and a lot of ideas interest them, but they don't have the time or the resources to bring it to life. So what they do is they put it in a file where the idea stays dead until they are ready to bring it to life. And I do that too. And I did that with the previous collection. I brought back stones and placed them all around the house. And I do that with so many other things like driftwood and whatnot. And you can check it out later if you're interested. But just surrounding yourself with pieces that excite you and bring joy. A lot of artists do this. I have a book about Picasso over here, if you want to go through, which shows his everyday activities and his whole space. It's big creative chaos. And I love that because there is so much focus on neatness and beauty and aesthetics that it kind of takes away the soul out of the creative process. Fill your space with like all sorts of tchotchkes and books and stuff that will excite you to create. Oh, and be willing to get bored. There is so much focus. Ooh, I clearly don't know how to operate that. There is so much focus on being ultra productive all the time, multitasking, that we don't allow our brain to just get bored and get creative. Because our brain is the most creative thing that we have, you know? You can always find ideas on TikTok and in Instagram and get, get into that rabbit hole. But sometimes when you do like mundane chores, like folding laundry, doing dishes, you're allowing your brain to get into that rhythm of doing something that's easy, that's familiar, and then when that's happening, your brain will come up with creative ways to keep itself busy and come up with ideas. And I do get a lot of creative ideas when I'm doing household chores. And finally, when you do have that flow state, because so many of you probably have already experienced that in your life, but when you do have the flow state, one thing that's missing is the courage to make it. And you're scared of being judged. You're scared of being disliked or worst ignored. You know, that's our biggest fear. I, I have that fear too. So what can we do? What can we do? We can look for support. We can find ourselves teachers. And you don't have to have a living teacher. You can look at people who are dead. I have learned more from people who are dead than people who are alive. So... Start looking at other people's work and imitate before you can innovate. And I'm not saying imitate their, their aesthetics and what they're doing specifically, but imitate the philosophy behind their approach. 
why they do some things and not others. Why are some choices um, more important than others? So I wanted to give you an example. So this is a piece by me. This is a piece by Noguchi. What I have stolen from Noguchi is his desire to collaborate with his material. He works with a lot of natural material like I do. And what he does is he doesn't want to strip away everything that the material brings to the table. He'll tweak just a little bit here, just a little bit there, like a little bit of blush. And yeah, you're good to go. And I try to imitate that, keeping the grain, keeping those interesting knots, because that makes it special. That makes it one of a kind. And then Noguchi did the same. He imitated Brancusi. So Brancusi was a sculptor in Paris, and Noguchi trained under him. And what he stole was from Brancusi was he really liked these bronze sculptures that he made. So when he went back to New York, he had easy access to sheet metal. So what he started doing was he started bending these sheet metal pieces and turning them into 3D form and then putting a bronze finish on it. And it kind of has the same aesthetic, but it doesn't, because he still made it his own. And then Brancusi stole too from African masks. So he started stealing from these African masks, and what he stole was these like exaggerated features, and then abstracted them and made them his own. So when you see that, you know it's Brancusi, but he also stole from someone. And I'm, I'm sure people who were doing these masks were also stealing from someone else. So again, steal, but steal with an intention of learning. And then perfection is just fear, you know? Perfection is just fear and fancy shoes and mink coat pretending to be elegant when actually it says again and again, I'm not good enough. I will never be good enough. But fear is primitive, you know? It's our primitive brain asking us to stay in the comfort zone because that's where it's safe, that's where it will stay alive. But art is not going to kill you, you know? Not here at least, not here. So if that is the case, then why not create some art? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pooja. Where are you going? <laughs> Can't run away yet. <laughs> thank you, Pooja. That was such a beautiful, creative talk conversation. And thank you for bringing in your pieces. I can't wait to interact with them. Please, before you leave, give them a touch. You know, most museums are like, don't touch this and that. We're encouraging you to touch. So if you have any questions for Pooja, uh, please raise your hand, and we'll uh, come around with a microphone. Okay, uh, thank you, Pooja, it was amazing. Um, I have a seven-year-old kid, and he's really creative. He loves daydreaming. Yeah. And I feel sometimes that our society, our, the schools, they kind of try to kill that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he has to finish his works in time. He has to, you know, be in that schedule. And that's just not him. And I'm yeah. like, am I killing this? So how do you keep that? You know, yeah. how, how do you keep that in our society and having to, you know, do yeah. those things? I have found that creating time for creativity, like going for drawing classes, piano, something that will still trigger those creative juices would help. And instead of like, doing a movie night maybe, which is, I love movie nights, but sometimes once in a blue moon, it would be amazing to just do like a drawing night or crafts night. Even for birthday parties, that could be an interesting thing. Um, Priya was doing, um, creating little pieces out of clay. That is an interesting way to go about it. Just instead of drawing what you're thinking, make it in clay and show it to me. What is it? And it also helps you think from 2D to 3D, you know, things like that. Yeah, that could help. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I just want to ask, like, um, in your process, like, with the flow state, like, what is it like when you know, like, you're close to finish or, like, no. so, like that moment where you're like, okay, now it's done. Like, yeah. what is that? What does that feel like for you? It's, in terms of flow state, I feel like it's just like that initial kick, you know, to keep going. And then as you start working, it evolves. And I like that, the flexibility of allowing it to evolve. You know, like even if you and I, we were collaborating tomorrow, I would love the idea of like maybe starting and then evolving into something else. And a lot of it is also artistic choice. You know, you can, the piece that I showed you earlier, I turned it black and then it's here in white because I wanted to make it white. I <laughs> so it, it is over when you say it's over, you know? Hi, um, thank you for sharing today. That was great. Um, question I had was, I, I looked through the sketchbooks. I hope that was okay. Yeah, um, that was but meant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one of the things you wrote was that you wanted to create good work. So just my question to you is, in, in your work, yeah. uh, what is good work to you? For me, good work is authentic work. You know, the, the sculptures that I'm creating right now, in my eyes, nobody has done it before in terms of like, creating that interactive element, still having that organic sculptures. And something that I'm striving to do is create more feminine forms, you know? I see that in sculpture world, at least, there is so much focus on these like very geometric shapes. Or they are organic, but yet you can tell the artist is um, male. And it's, it's changing, and I feel like I'm actively trying to do that without losing my identity. I don't want to create just feminine forms that don't resonate with me. I want them to be authentic, too. I hope that answers your question. Um, so wood is pretty great. Uh, what, do you, what do you love about working with wood? And are you considering any other materials for your yeah. future explorations? For me, wood is a very familiar material. I've seen, like, I've always had wood in my house. Growing up, I would see my grandfather just whittling away pieces of wood. So it was a very familiar material. Um, and I also went to furniture design school because I wanted to create in wood. And I didn't know that wood was just a medium for me, you know? I don't have to create functional pieces. I can create sculptural pieces too. But honestly, I did not know about this back then. Um, since then, I have done some work in clay. I did some work in stone. And I'm still working in stone because I, I do love the idea of working in stone. And I, I initially started working in clay because I was kind of exhausted by just fulfilling orders. And it kind of started becoming a job more than passion. So I started creating in clay, and I took a break from woodworking for four months. And one day, just out of the blue, I was like, let me just go to the wood shop and check what offers they have going up. So yeah, I love working with other materials. But you know, I feel like wood is my soulmate. And I love other friends. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious about your flow state, and in my mind it sounds like it would be very serene, but yeah. I think when I'm in it, I often get confronted by walls of frustration, anger, mm. or just like mm. really getting stuck in my body, so yeah. I'm wondering how that takes shape for you and how you navigate through that. I have big imposter syndrome, so I know what you're trying to say. Um, I don't know. Usually I don't have that like intrusive, destructive thought process. I'm, I have had that. It's shifting lately. But when I do have doubts, I usually junk, e eat junk and cry. But <laughs> then st <laughs> you can ask my husband. He's right here. January and February was really hard. <laughs> Uh, but I, yes, I I just go and 
create a practice around it, you know? Like almost treat it like work and just go in the studio and create and just sketch out and it would lead to something else. Um, even after the sculpture collection, I, I could not figure out what my next collection was gonna be because it's again like a rat race, you know? Like you want to keep going. And I just couldn't figure out what the next collection was gonna be. So I just started working with these like drift, failed wood, driftwood pieces and just started creating and maybe a collection would come out of it. So just, yeah, fight it, keep going. <laughs> I'm just wondering, in your process, like, how do you know when you're done with a piece, and how do you balance that with the pursuit of perfection? I have, I, I love this mantra called done is better than perfect. So I just focus on that, like finishing it. And like I said earlier, it's done when you say it's done. And you have that, at least I have that freedom because I don't have clients who are giving me a brief and I have to fulfill it, I create the brief, I create the product, and once it's ready. So I have a little bit of leeway in that, but yeah, for me it's like, when I say it's done, it's done. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Pooja. Hey. <laughs> um, I had a question about the flow state. Um, I find it's, there's oftentimes this voice inside your head that's yeah. like telling you no, you can't. I don't know mm. if it's, people in your head or whatever it is, but how do you overcome that voice of judgment that's like right. telling you no, like don't create weirdly, don't yeah. don't be like out of the box, like do, do you experience that? And if so, how do you overcome it? I don't know if you believe in this, but I'm a fire sign <laughs> and I'm also a rebel. So if somebody is telling me you can't do it, I have this deep desire of doing it, so. I don't know, that's just who I am. And I always have been that person, but it's it doesn't affect me that much when people don't like your work. I remember this quote, this one graphic designer said it a while back. He's like, if everybody is liking your work, you're not doing it right. You're not pushing yourself enough. So some criticism is good because the, you're still they still are invested, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that helps. <laughs> we have time for one more question. But if you do have questions for Pooja, please go up to her afterwards. Hi, thank you. Hey. How do you rekindle your passion? It's crazy. So earlier I was talking about that ceramic collection that I did. Um, and it was almost like I was in a break with wood because I was just annoyed and I was just like, get out of my face now. And then one day I was just missing it. So <laughs> I just went back to this wood shop, brought back a bunch of wood. My husband doesn't like it because I spend a lot of money on wood. Like some people like spending on shopping, wood is shopping for me. <laughs> um, so I just like to spend time around wood, which is so weird, you know? Like <laughs> yeah, but. Maybe just taking a break and exploring other avenues, going on a vacation really helps. A yoga retreat, meditation. I'm a deep believer in that, you know. <laughs> just taking a break and coming back. Because if you truly love something, you will create, you know, if you true. It's almost like having an affair, like you, even if you have like 15 minutes, you wanna make out in the stairwell and like just, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs>